hi. Here it comes. Setting up the YouTube live so we can uh, talk to you about stuff. Here we go. All right, there it is. Hi, Julia. Hi. How, How are, are you? you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Sitting in the studio. Having Tool Tip Tuesday. Tool Tip Tuesday. I I'm usually I don't get to. Uh, usually I don't get to do that, but I get to do that today because. Welcome to summertime. Not welcome to summertime. I'm not working with my <laughs> students. I'm trying to find us on. Let me see if I can get it over here um, on our YouTube channel so you can follow along and be our moderator. I'm trying to get there and Helen is so much more competent. Hello, Helen, about this kind of thing. So uh, let me see if I can get in there. Yeah, I can see the chat. All right. So um, so we were talking a little bit. Uh, we were on Instagram live just before this and we were talking about myths in the jewelry studio. Right. And we've got a couple of that are really important to sort of know about. The um, one of them we were talking about was the uh, pickle pot, because there right. are so many myths about pickle and pickle pots and how it works and, you know, who's doing what to who and you know, right. <laughs> things that you, right. you know, never touch that. Pickle because, myths. Ah, ah, <laughs> you know. So. Um, so. What I am curious about is um, if you've got, there we go, we got my popped out chat, there it is. Um, so yeah, if you guys are, you know, uh, make sure you uh, click the like button and let us know you're out there. The, um, there we go, one like. Um, so yeah, yeah, click that like button, let us know what's going on. Um, ask us questions, if you've got um, any questions about the myths and things that we're talking about, we'd love to hear it. Or if you have a or have heard a myth in the studio and you're like, what what is this? Why is this a thing? Um, is this true? <laughs> Where did this myth come from? So the um, uh, thing that I wanted to talk about is uh, with Julia first off is the pickle myth about steel. So. Summarize your myth with steel, Julia. Steel, my steel myth. Okay, so um, if you put steel in the pickle, either in the form of binding wire or if you use a pair of tweezers or something to drop something in, and your steel is in contact with some other non-ferrous item in the pickle pot, the, the copper that's in the pickle will plate out onto the piece, right? It will plate out right. onto steel and onto whatever the steel is touching. So right. it, this is why, you know, as jewelry teachers, we are adamant about you have to remove all binding wire from your piece, even if it, I tell students, even if it's stainless steel, because technically stainless steel won't do this. But it's like, just just get in the habit of taking the binding wire off. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the but if you take but, it out, but the myth is that if you have done this and dipped some steel in the pickle that somehow now the pickle is permanently contaminated and that is a myth that is not true so it's not true so once you remove the steel the pickle goes back to doing the job that it has always been doing of removing the flux and the oxides and it will keep doing that for right. months even years so you don't have to change your pickle just because you had an oops and you had some steel in the pickle. You do not have to change your pickle. That just is get the, just get the pickle out. Just get it out. So out. with um there we go. I've <laughs> got like this this thing haunting me right now. Um so with the um uh if you leave the steel in there though, it will etch the steel. And so you need to like then you might you, not, you need to get it problem. out. You need to get it out because it will um I mean, yes, it will etch the steel and anything that comes in, if the steel is like sitting in the bottom of your pickle pot and any, and you drop something new in there, if it's in contact with the steel, then it will plate copper onto it. So right. you just take right. the steel out and then you're fine. But you yeah. don't have to throw the pickle out, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it is, um, you know, and we, we had talked about too with the, the pickle, it acts as a, uh, like an electrical current. It completes the current in that electrolyte. Mm -hmm. and turns it basically into like a battery 
So mm-hmm. anything that's in contact with the steel will attract the copper that's in the pickle. Mm-hmm. So if you've got um, something that you want to pickle plate, something that's copper, brass, bronze, and you want to like disguise the solder steam, that works really well. I usually take it out and do it separately, but so it can, works really well. Yeah, you can, and you can, you can control it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I use it to plate granules for granulation too. So yeah. it's the, right. this is a, this is a feature, not a defect right. of your pickle pot. It's a feature, right? right? That it okay. will do this thing and it can be really useful. You just have to make sure that you are getting it to do it when you want it to. But it does right. it right. your pickle if you use it that way, right? So if you right. use it that way, you can just put the, like when I plate granules, I just put the pickle. Need a better light. Yeah. <laughs> However. Fighting with my light today. Fighting with my light. Um, but the. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's got me. Um, but the the thing that uh, hey there, <laughs> if you need to dispose of your pickle, go yeah. over to Julia's website, uh, which is the um, Shoebox Studios. Studio dot com. Here I'll, I'll take <coughs> put it into the chat so you can be there. Shoebox Studio dot com. And if you go over there right. to Shoebox Studio dot com and you search for pickle, or even if you just look, I think it's like the top in the top couple of articles. Um, right. It will tell you how you can safely dispose of pickle because one of the other myths about pickle is that you can safely dispose of it after you've neutralized it with baking soda. And that's not true. Right. Because it still has all the copper in it and the copper is really toxic to aquatic life. So we don't want to put it down the drain and you really don't want to right. put it in your septic system either. Cause it's not good for the, the septic system. No, so no. either to safely dispose of it, either take it to household hazardous waste, or you can do a little home science experiment, right? You just need to get some pH strips and some um, calc, you know, it's, what is it called? It's slaked lime. They, they use it in pickling. Um, you can get it. I got it at Ace Hardware and you can get it online as well. So and all of that information is in the article and it will tell you exactly what you need and where to get it. So you need like pickle lime for your pickle. Kind of. Yeah, you do. Kind of. Yeah. Um, well, um, so with the um, with my pickle, there it is. Um, my pickle, I've got uh, uh, usually I do like a uh, like a double boiler sort of situation. So I have like water in my pickle pot and then uh, like a canning jar, like a jar, bell jar or whatever they are of um, a pickle in it. But I also have one that's got like um, vinegar and salt. And I have one that has uh, that I use for like patinas. So I have different ones and I can just put them into my uh, crock pot and keep them warm when I need them rather than having the entire pickle pot dedicated to pickle. <laughs> right. It also extends the life of the crock pot enormously. So I'm real happy about that because I hate it when you've got to like, people will go and, and get caulk and do it around the top and like watertight their thing. And then it, it's going to eat through the glass in your ceramic yes, anyway. That's what so, pickle does is it eats through the flux which is glass so eventually it will eat through the glaze on the inside of your crock pot and that is exactly what's happening to mine because I did not know I did not know the brilliant solution of the Stenhouse to put water in my crock pot and then put a glass jar yeah. not it, the, the same way it, the 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 pickle will etch glass and that's the whole reason for using it to etch off flux and things like etch that a glass jar so, away, will it or will it eventually? Uh, over time, it will. It's not as aggressive on like glass like that, but like on ceramic, it will like <laughs> into the yeah, into that yeah. stuff. Yeah, a little more porous. So anyway, other myths. Other myths. Other myths. Myth. We had another one about pickle. Oh, the other one about pickle is that if it's blue, if it's turning oh, blue, yeah. that that you, you don't have to throw it out either, right? Like you can yeah. use the pickle until it's like. You know, until it doesn't work anymore. Right. I mean, my pickle. You can use pickle like, until it doesn't work anymore. Right. Exactly. You use it it's until it's just it getting. Work. Yeah. The blue just means it's getting saturated with copper. That's all it means. And it just and, means it's plate oh. really well when you use it for copper plating. And yeah, exactly. And here's another myth because a lot of people are like, 
Don't I have to have two pickle pots? One for silver and one for brass and bronze? No. <laughs> I'm like, no. no. That's just so that when students <laughs> are in a classroom, you're not screwing it up for everybody. <laughs> so that the silver doesn't have as much copper in it, so they don't have to change it as often. It doesn't get as dirty. And if everybody's using the same pickle pot and like, the one that's got copper, brass, bronze, and other in there does get nasty quicker. They can change that one. And the silver pickle pot has a longer life because it's not etching out as much copper. But I've had people say, "Is you know, I thought you had to pickle them separately. And I'm like, nope. <laughs> right, which, you no, know, you don't. <laughs> it's, the students in that circumstance can be forgiven for thinking that there's something different about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. because they go to North or Pratt or someplace like that and they're two pickle pots and they're like, oh my God, yeah. when I have my own studio, I'm going to have to have two. And they don't realize that it's a feature, it's, you know, it's, it's a function of just, mass use. Right. Mass use. That's a really good yeah. way to put it that, yeah, yeah. that, you know, you're so not it's, have that problem in a studio. A small yeah, studio. There's, there's no reason to do that. I mean, if you wanted to have two pickle pots, I might have one with the sodium bisulfate and one with vinegar and salt. So I could use that one for brass. But like I said, I've got my jars. If I'm working with brass or bronze, I'll have the vinegar and salt, which doesn't turn it pink the way that the liver of, or the uh, sodium bisulfate will etch out the, the zinc and tin quicker, leaving that copper surface and that blush on the surface. So it's basically like fire scale um, that's left on the surface. But if you use vinegar and salt, that doesn't happen. So anyway, that's the myth there. People are like, oh, it's plating my piece. I'm like, no, it's fetching out all the, the lesser chemicals or you know, minerals first. Anywho. That's a good one. That's a good jewelry myth. People yeah. think that when they put brass in the pickle, that what's happening is the copper is plating onto the brass. And that's why it's coming right. out. And it's not. Right. What's actually happening is the zinc, which is in the alloy, the mix, so it's copper and zinc is what brass is made of. And the right. zinc is really volatile. So when you heat brass uh, to solder it, it will start that process because some of the zinc will go off of the surface. But then when you put it in the pickle, it will pull even more zinc out of the surface. And then what's left behind is the copper and the copper's pink. So it's really that it's depleted the surface of zinc. Right, right. Exactly. It's your depletion gilding your piece. <laughs> depletion coppering. <laughs> so yeah, depletion, your depletion coppering. Well, um, one of my, I have to say, there's um, uh, a couple of myths that I really love that are around stones and stone setting. Yeah. And, you know, stones are so chock full of, of myths and symbolism and, and all that good stuff too, right. that, you know, people use, you know, stones and and, you know, for all kinds of reasons throughout the millennia to, you know, bring good luck, to ward off evil, to, you know, um, you know, indicate that there's poison in the bottom of the thing or, you know, so, I mean, there, I mean, stones have been used, which is a myth, by the way, don't, don't rely on any stones to tell you if there's poison in your cup, but, <laughs> but there's just, there's some one that always hits me about opals that I think is really funny. And it's that, you know, because opals are October's birthstone. And the myth is that if it's not your, if opal isn't your birthstone, then it's bad luck to wear it, which is a ridiculous myth, obviously. But the, um, one of the reasons that that myth sort of came into existence is because um, there's such, they, they also have the myth of, of holding all the power of all the other stones because they're all colorful. So they have like little flashes of all the other stones. But if you wear it outside of that month of October, it's bad luck. So a lot of, um, I, this is a myth that evolved out of jewelry studios because way back in the dark ages, because uh, opals were so fragile. And if anybody like royalty wanted you to make something with these opals, you know, and they're so fragile, you cracked it or, you know, destroyed this opal, um, you know, it would be like off with your head. So it was like, oh, you know what? It's really bad luck to wear opals if it's not your birthday. <laughs> so 
really bad luck. All all the power of all these other stones, if you wear it when it's not your birth, all that bad stuff will happen to you. <laughs> so it's um it was kind of a myth that got started a really, really, really ancient long time ago. But um, some people still, I've, I've heard that every now and then people will say something like, isn't it bad luck to wear opal if it's not your, if you're not born in October? And I'm like, no, and here's why. <laughs> but it's, it, yeah, that was totally created by is- jewelers to to protect themselves from having to make anything with opals right because they'd want to sell opal jewelry but who knows yeah but it's just like you know for you sir no you don't want to do that that's just a harbinger of like evil you don't know what and if it breaks you know then it's on you (laughs) so yeah so opals that's one of my other favorite jewelry notes there's just there's so many funny ones that i'm just kind of like opals and water like you know i've seen people with like little tubes of opal that's like they're selling and like i'm like a stone that has to live in water is not much help to anyone because you're gonna have to put it in a piece of jewelry where it can't be in a vial so it's like why why do opals have to be in water well isn't that like not a thing i mean that's not it's it is well the reason that they put it in water is because opals will dry out and if they haven't been stabilized they have a tendency to like you know, kind of come apart so um so a lot of times they'll put them in water to keep them kind of stable and in a stable environment but you know they're so susceptible to um to moisture content and heat and cold and all that stuff because it's just basically like fossilized water <laughs> and, so, and silica and it's got like like little doesn't make any food. sense to buy an opal that's in a tube of water like if i'm going somewhere and somebody's trying to sell me an opal that's in water it's like okay now but really all i'm getting from that is that this is stone is too fragile for me to be handling because i don't know how to stay not, and, not, and that's not necessarily true either um i've gotten when i was in mexico i got uh, a, a vial of opals i was like sure why not they were cheap and you know and they were beautiful jelly opals and i was like okay well i can i can stabilize them so i'll you know see see what i've got and so uh i actually had a friend that was doing some laboratory work with opals for did it for me and i've got some really nice opals out of that batch and uh, one of them alone was more than enough to pay for the cost of the entire compile but but you did have to have someone do something to them for you Right. I did stabilize them and then somebody cut them. Yeah. And somebody yeah. cut them for me. So, oh, but, but, it but yeah, the, rough. it was what? It was rough. Yeah. They were rough little, little rough. gems so in a jar. Cut stones. No, no, no. Okay. Um, try the, to sell you cut stones in water or is that not a thing? No, I haven't seen that. I've only seen the rough. Yeah. Okay. And I've seen like Ethiopian opals that have come out of water and they just kind of go <laughs> and self destruct. The minute you take them out of the water so yeah because they're not stabilized as well right. so yeah so it's it is yeah that is another crazy myth so what other myths are there in jewelry well you know much more about stones than i do but i one of my other favorite ones is the tumbler myth oh the tumbler myth yes right yeah about work hardening in the tumbler work hardening right so um yeah. It's, you know, tumbling does change the surface of the metal a little bit. It will shine the metal, right? That's the purpose of tumbling in either a pin finisher or, you know, with tumbling medium, either a rotary tumbler or vibratory tumblers, usually to shine it up, right? Right. But there's a myth that if you put your silver piece or gold or whatever in the tumbler, that it will harden the surface. And so there are people... Right maintain that you shouldn't tumble a bezel setting before you try to set the stone because it will harden the bezel material which is not true it's i mean it's not true that it will harden it enough to make a damn bit of difference it is true that it will very very slightly harden like the The first surface of layers of molecules but right enough so it's like yes it will harden it but it's like the thinnest skin on the surface that doesn't harden the piece 
appreciably enough for you to even yeah. be able to feel it when you're pushing the bezel over. Yeah, there's, um, I, I know that there have been actually scientific research that's yes. been done I'm on that. Gonna say, um, that because that people are like, oh, I'm going to throw it in the tumbler to work hard in it. And it's like, no. Um, so if you're looking for something that, you know, and, and, and willing to throw it into any tumbler, which does make a difference. So if I'm using something like my pen finisher, bing, um, up there, the pen finisher is burnishing the surface so quickly and so fast that it really isn't, it's doing a shine on just glamping off the surface so quickly that it's just, you know, doing that kind of motion across the surface. And so it really is not doing a lot of work hardening at all. The, um, uh, the vibratory tumblers are kind of the same thing. It's just sort of like rubbing the surface really, you know, pretty gently. Mm -hmm. So again, you don't have a whole lot of work hardening going on. However, with the rotary tumblers, where you've got steel shot in there and it's dropping as it hits your piece, it's like tiny hammers actually impacting the surface. So it does have a tendency to work harden it a little bit deeper than the pin finisher or the rotary or the vibratory tumbler will. So the, but still it's not very much. And it's so they could they tested it and looked at like the differences and what had happened and and the, the rotary tumbler, because of that, that kind of repeated like falling of media, did do a little bit more on the surface, but still it's just the surface. Not, so not what, enough. Like it's, yeah. like it's just not enough. And especially if your most bezels are fine silver too, or yeah. a lot of them. And fine silver exactly, is yeah. a lot harder to work harden than sterling. So right. it's... I mean, yes, that, this is the problem, is that the, the myth usually has a, a tiny grain of truth. It's true, yeah. It's like it'll, it'll work hard on the surface. It'll and sometimes that'll make something clear. just stiff enough, like earring wires and things like that. And I know people that are like, oh, yeah, it kind of made my earring wire harder and I didn't have to hammer it. And I'm like, hmm. So here's what works, though. I think hardening. mostly it's people, it's like, it's like a placebo, like people believe that it's true. And so then they experience it as true, yeah. even if it's not true, um, right. because placebos do work. Like what you believe you will, you will perceive, oh, it feels like it's different. It's like, it was actually, <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah. Um, starting with like, you know, full hard. I think this is interesting too. Some people want to start with like, full hard sterling and then they're going to solder it <laughs> then it won't be hard anymore and i'm like you understand that that just annealed it all <laughs> anything that got hot enough is now annealed you know so um so you're going to have to work hard in the part that you did solder because if that's no longer yeah that's no longer half hard or full hard at this point however the thing that you can do is heat harden and so if you want to, um, and I've heard it, uh, somebody was asking me about age hardening and heat hardening as basically just a difference in terminology. And some people will take it out and let it air cool down to temperature. Um, but with, uh, with gold, you need to quench it because that will like freeze it in that anneal or that hardened state. And you can like take it straight out of the oven into uh, the water. Um, and I'll do that with silver and gold, uh, gold fill. And it works great. So basically what you have to do you, is sorry. heat. You put it in the kiln for about an hour. Um, and it, depending on how thick the piece is, if it's a really heavy piece, you may not need to heat harden it at all. But for things like earring wires and filigree and um, things that are a little too delicate to like work harden any other way, you can use the kiln and it just goes up to go, take it up to 572 for about an hour, take it out, quench it, then pen finish it or tumble it, and that will get it looking all good. And I like doing that because it also raises some of the, the fine silver up a little bit too and depletion builds it. So it goes, it comes out looking better. Um, from the kiln than it did going in. <laughs> so um, in between though, right? I pickle in between. Yeah. So I'll pickle it coming out of the, um, out of the kiln because it'll raise some of the oxide and okay. then put it into the pickle 
I put it into the pickle immediately and then rinse it and then into yeah, that the, the pin finisher. With the heat, some of the copper yeah. in the surface will oxidize. Yeah. 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 So you, you basically are raising like that copper uh, oxide up to the surface. And then when you pickle it right after that, it just, and it's like beautiful white and then into the pin finisher and you're off to the races again. But yes. it, uh, but it, you can, you can feel and hear the difference when it comes out of the kiln. It's like, ping, ping, ping. I mean, it, it really makes a difference. Like but that is also sound. a specific fact, right? They have also done yeah. research on like exactly, that's why you know it's 572 degrees because stuff has been done. Research has yeah. been done to determine right. like what is the temperature that you have to raise it to in order yeah. to be hard, right? Yeah. And if you leave it at too high a temperature for too long, it can actually make it brittle. So mm -hmm. you don't want to leave it like in the kiln at a thousand degrees for you know a day or two. <laughs> because it it actually all the the um the uh dendrites will actually open up so much from the heat that they will just get brittle and so you don't want to leave it in there too long but doing about 572 for about an hour and then just quench it pickle it into the pen finisher and it looks great but yeah what other myths are there I don't know. So another stone myth. Some, can we give us another stone myth? stone myth? I'm trying to think of. Uh, well, stone myth, stone myth. Well, I do like that. Um, one of the, um, yeah, there's so many about like the healing properties of stones. And for some people, you know, again, those, those are very real. Um, and there are certain stones that, you know, have, you know, copper and, iron and things in them that, that can make a difference I suppose um, but um, one of the um, ones that I think is really interesting just in terms of properties of stones is amethyst because with amethyst if you leave them in you know a warm place and some people will be like oh well, I need to like leave it in the sun to like purify it and it's like yeah it'll purify the color right out of it uh, <laughs> because what it'll do is actually amethysts are very sensitive to heat and light and they actually will fade in sunlight and in heat. And that's actually how they make like good, um, like citrines is they'll heat amethyst to a certain temperature. And because when they're formed, they actually form in the same lava tube, citrines and amethyst. And the citrines basically form in hotter temperature water and amethyst uh, form in cooler water. So it's, it's basically that difference of temperature. So if you heat those amethysts or leave them in the sun too long, they will they'll fade right down. And I've seen somebody do that with uh, an amethyst that they were trying to solder a piece and it started getting warm and you could see the color just drain right out of it. It was like, whoa, because it was a very deep amethyst and it just got real warm. And they were like, uh-oh. <laughs> I'm like, well, I mean, you can buy ametrine right? Because they are yeah. chemically the same thing. It's just the temperature at which they were formed. And so you can buy stones that are purple on one end and orange on the other because they're yeah. the same stone. I thought yeah. of another, I thought of another myth. Do you tell. This has to do with files. So people oh. have this idea that you have to have separate files for steel and non-ferrous metals, right? And you don't. Or for, so, for gold and silver and everything. Yeah. You don't. You don't. The only one you have to be careful about is what? Platinum. You do have to have separate files for platinum because the platinum will contaminate other stuff. Yeah. But most of us are not working with platinum. If you're working or with pewter, pewter will too. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So pewter and platinum, the peas, don't mix pewter and platinum files with any other files. Because the pewter, right. you pewter in because pewter is what is it it's tin and i don't know antimony and tin and antimony or antimony um yeah if you get that on your silver it'll eat holes in it right but yeah. you don't have to have different files for silver and gold and steel the big one is the you know don't use the files on steel like if you're making tools if you're making punches like don't use your good files on steel it's like no totally fine matthew chemony right the god of stamp making uses his files on steel and then also on silver and gold. 
What you do want to do, though, is clean them well after you've used them on right. steel. Because you don't want, this is back to steel and a pickle, you don't want little tiny particles of steel to be transferred onto your... Right. And then right. accidentally end up in the pickle. So, but you can the, just the yeah. other thing that people will will be like, oh well, I can't use my wax file, you know, my metal file for my wax. And I'm like, oh sure you can. <laughs> Hurt the file, it just clogs up the you teeth. Lubricate your file. I mean, <laughs> yeah. but you probably don't want metal in your wax. But you know, it's not going to hurt your file because it's just wax. It's just wax. So, clean it yeah, up. I actually I actually use a number of different metal files and not like coarse wax files for my waxes because they're smoother and I can get a better surface. Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing fine tuning stuff, I'm actually using like a single cut or a bastard cut file rather mm -hmm. than like wax files or coarse files because they just they work better on the surface. So. It leaves you a really smooth surface too, the single cut. So I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. Single cut meaning the cuts all go in one direction instead of the double cut where they're crossing over each other, correct? Right, right. So yeah, another myth. Another you myth. don't have to use, you don't have to have different files for steel. And you, I mean, you, you're not gonna be filing hardened steel, right? You're gonna be filing soft annealed tool steel. <laughs> right. If you, if you file something that's hardened, it will- Do nothing. <laughs> nothing to your file. Yeah, so <laughs> like zink, right across yeah. glass. That's what it feels thing, like. It could damage your file. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Sure. Let's see, what else? What are some other good jewelry lists? I know there, there are, are some good ones. Yeah, I, um, I, yeah, there's, you know, I, there's so many. There's so many crazy little things that, that I think as far as like, you know, everyday behaviors that we do that we kind of take for granted, we just sort of absorb or are in you know, classes and someone has taught us a particular way of doing something. And it's like, you don't wanna do that because of X, Y, you know, X, Y, Z. And so people leave into the world and think that's the way that you have to do it because if I don't, some you know, dragon's gonna come up and you know, you know, yeah. drag me away. So <laughs> like, it's like yeah. cutting the ends off the ham, right? You know, it's like the, the old story about the young woman who, you know, would cut the ends off of the ham to to put in the, the oven. Like the ham always had to have the ends cut off. And she and her husband knew bride and her husband's like, what are you doing? And she's like, well, my mom always cut the ends off the ham. And so they, she asked her mom, like, mom, why, why, why did you cut the ends off them? She's like, I don't know. I, my mom always did it that way. And so they asked grandma, like, why, why did you cut the ends off the ham? She's like, oh, honey, when we were first married, we lived in such a tiny place. I had such a tiny oven and I had this tiny little roast pan and my, a big roast wouldn't fit or big ham wouldn't fit. So I had to cut the ends off to make it fit in the pan. Right. And so thus began a three generation tradition of cutting yes. the ends off the ham. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and that's that's how a lot of them begin. Right. And it's just, you know, things like, you know, like the opal. And right. but like I always thought that was really kind of a funny myth. But anyway, yeah. Well, Julia, if you think it's a more good myth, let me know. I will. I will. I should okay. probably go. We should probably go. It's not the time to yeah. go. You know. We talk about myths all day long. Yeah. Do. And that you guys, if you think of any. Post them in the comments, um, and uh, and we'll do a we'll do a jewelry myth two at some point, and do a, a jewelry myth. Jewelry round. myth two. Jewelry what? Myth two. <laughs> <laughs> what are you pointing at? Are you pointing at your my pickle? Yeah. Oh, your pickle. Oh, I see behind you. Yes. I was Cover shot. Your light <laughs> was missing. <laughs> okay. Well, you people. Um, we, uh, we, I will be in the open studio access tomorrow at 10. Yeah, so if you guys want to come and ask me any questions about fabrication or chain making or things like that, I'm not the a stone guru. Um, but Mondays, Mondays is when uh, Jennifer is in the studio and in the open studio access. And so she can answer your stone questions and casting questions. And then Helen is on deck on Fridays. So if you have PMC questions or glass questions, she's your girl. 
Absolutely. Um, well, and and you know, all of us have general information. All of us so have general information. Any day is always a good day to, to pop in. And um, and we have a number of people that are working on different projects. So you can pop in, ask questions, hang out, listen right. to what everybody else is working on. And um, it's, it's so much good information and sharing of resources. And it's a good community group of people. Right. Um, so I would highly recommend it. I'm really excited about the open access. It just it is exceeded all my expectations. Yeah, our first, because, our first week. This is our first. We just finished like, yeah. the first week. And it went really well, and it was really fun. And actually, all three right. of us on Monday, and in, in the so sometimes you get more than one fox, right? True, true. So and so, days. yeah, if you have, you know, hours Monday, left Wednesday, Friday, time. and we've had, yeah, Chris Anderson popped in uh, yesterday, and he's full of great, you know, solutions and and answers. And so you never know who's going to pop in to the class and and have great ideas and and comments. So exactly. join us. Won't you? Yes. Yes. Go over to the website. <laughs> the the you can get the bundle for three months, July, August, and September, and it's fifteen percent off of the regular price. Which the regular price yep. is a screaming deal because the regular price is only sixty five dollars for a whole month of access. It's the same mm -hmm. Zoom link for the whole month, right? Um, but sixty five bucks for twenty hours. Even if you start, even if you join right now and you just started yeah. tomorrow. And you had only 14 hours left in the month, which is what's left in the month. It's still a screaming deal. So it is. And, you know, because we when we first started doing this, uh, we had people asking us, you know, if we did monitor hours or one on one and, you know, mentoring hours. And it's right. really hard to to get that scheduled. So right. it works out better for everybody to kind of share the expense exactly. of being in in what we have to do. <laughs> make it go right. and then, everybody, um, and then everybody benefits as well so it you know you're sort of sharing the expense of mentoring with others but right. you've also got more uh you're learning exponentially because there's so many people that are sharing information and um and that works out really well for everybody i learned stuff too yeah you know, we talk about new tools we talk about how to use other to old tools we talk about how to set stones and it, it's been yeah it's good yeah been really good using okay it, using it as an accountability buddy right like we're going to be there yeah you come and work in your studio don't we'll be there you can be there too you can be there <laughs> come and join us Bye. all right so uh thanks everybody and we will see you next week if you want to see more of the tool tips make sure to um follow us to subscribe ring the bell if you want to know when we're live because sometimes we're doing uh slow jewelry or uh, doing uh, an interview or something like that. Mm -hmm. But we also have other free content as well as our tool tips and shorts. So check out the rest of the channel when you get a chance. And, uh, but yeah, hit that, smash that like button and, and subscribe. And that way you can follow us and know all, all kinds of good jewelry things with us. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. All right, Julia, thanks a lot for joining me tonight. Yeah, it was fun. And I, I love it when summer comes around and I, I have a little more time to be in my studio. Yeah. You, I always love hanging out with you. So me too. Me too. Yeah. All right, Kitty. I will talk to you later and uh, have a great evening, everybody. We'll talk to you later on.